Thank you very much. Will you forgive me if I sit down? The, uh, the spirit is as willing as ever, but the flesh, though there's a lot of it, is, incl is inclined to be a little weak. Um, I think you did well um, to recall the death of the young fisherman to start with. It reminds us that um, life on this island is still precarious, even though the invaluable airline is there and boats come and go. And it reminds us that we're talking, in the end, about uh, a solemn occasion down at Cosgar, or 1916, and what happened afterwards. And um, it, is, it is a time, above all, when we do well to, to look back down the arches of the years and say, was it worth it? which is the kind of minimalist way of looking at it, or did we live up to their vision? And I think it's fair to say that given the events of the recent crash, a lot of people would have been inclined to say, and would still, and with great validity, say, no, we haven't. Uh, and I would like to talk about that. Obviously, one can't avoid it. But since... Um, 1916's anniversary, uh, 100th year anniversary dawned, something else came along, Brexit, which had an enormous effect that we haven't yet seen, a bit like the tsunami out to sea. When it hits the land, though, that's when you look out. And it hasn't yet hit the land, but there's an extraordinary similarity to the spirit that prevailed in the English Tory party during this anniversary year of 1916 and what happened in the run-up to 16 and which caused it. Now, I think one of the failures of academic historians has been to, uh, because of the North and the, the Troubles, because a lot of them were educated in English universities, particularly uh, Peterborough and Cambridge, Peter House, rather, in, in Cambridge, they uh, shy away from predicating 1916 by, with, or from the North and what was done there. Now, I would like to begin with discussing what happened in the run-up to 1916, of what it did to us, to our country, what it may yet do, and the implications of Brexit obviously have to be, they can only be speculated on, but they should be addressed. And I think they will have the effect of propelling the North more and more into the daily warp and woof of Irish politics. And uh, overall, I, I would like to end up by giving you a small personal uh, fragment uh, a, an, an inset, if you like, an, uh, into the type of people that the 1916 leaders were. So, to begin with, the actual run-up to the rising itself. As far as um, the overall situation in Ireland can be said, you could sum it up, and it's not exactly a flippant way, it's, it's unfortunately true, to say that syphilis had a very bad effect in Irish history. Uh, Henry VIII, the great Tudor, was, as we know, a syphilitic, and it's to him we look for the plantation in Ulster with the Scots Protestant element that uh, are still there. And the other syphilitic was Randolph Churchill, uh, whose grandson, Winston Churchill's son, said very truly when he was editing the memoirs of his great father and of the family, he coined the phrase which explains why six northeastern counties of Ireland are now part of the United Kingdom. The phrase was, Ulster will fight and Ulster will be right. That phrase was coined in 1886, along with the playing of what he called the orange card, 
And the orange card was blatantly, flatly, a plague on the fears and prejudices of the Ulster Unionists, and they were then Ulster, it was nine counties, uh, for purely domestic uh, conservative party politics. He had uh, uh, neither Randolph Churchill nor his major allies, Lord Birkenhead and F.E. Smith and the successors to the leadership of the Tory party like Bonner Law, had any affection for the Ulster Protestants, nor any belief in their cause, their sincerity or prejudice or whatever. In fact, he's on record as saying that he viewed those foul Ulster Tories as ruining our Conservative Party. But nevertheless, in 1886, when Gladstone, under pressure from the Irish Parliamentary Party and Parnell, was moved to introduce a Home Rule Bill, he thought, as he said, that the way to trump uh, Gladstone was to play the orange card. And they did. And what that consisted of, in a nutshell, was the exercise of dementia. He crossed over to a peaceful Ulster, a peaceful Belfast, and so rabble-roused in a famous speech in the Ulster Hall that from then on you're talking about pogrom, riot, and naked sectarianism. That was a year of riot in Belfast. And successive efforts to introduce Home Rule brought about similar responses. And that was deliberately carried on. <coughs> uh, Churchill didn't see the year out, the, the century out he died. We understand of syphilis or something aligned to it. And maybe that's an important fact, maybe you can give him some Fool's pardon in history that his brain was damaged for what he did. But he did it anyway. And coldly and calculatedly, Bonner Law, who was the successor to him in the run-up to the Great War, played the same orange card. And there were a few phrases I would recall to you. One he told a monster meeting uh, that there were no lengths to which the Ulster Unionists would go in their resistance to home rule that they wouldn't be supported in England. And he would support them. The wealthy, powerful Tory party would support them. Not the poor fools who listened to him as they believed for a Protestant Ulster, but to get rid of the Liberals and to get into power. And in the intervening uh, years, from the introduction of the orange card, and Ulster will fight, and Ulster will right, be right, the Irish Parliamentary Party had been shattered by the fall of Parliament. But a man who deserves better than he has got out of Irish history, I think John Redmond, had nearly put Humpty Dumpty together again. And he'd managed to get the Irish Parliamentary Party within striking distance of home rule again. And there was talk of a parliament in Dublin. Now, I'll explain to you in a moment why the parliament would have been pretty well ineffective, but it would have been a parliament in Dublin. And it would have been very difficult, if not impossible, for the men of 1916 to have risen against their own parliament. They had voted, the Irish public, remember, in successive elections, they had voted sometimes by majorities of five to one in favor of home rule. And blatantly, as I say, their wishes at the ballot box had been frustrated by the threat of force, by fascist tactics. The conservative uh, and unionist party, as they made very great play of, and that was not done again. It was being played down because of the troubles until very recently when the present leader of the Tory party in England reminded her listeners that it is the Conservative and Unionist party, and stressed the Unionist element, with the eye not alone in Ireland, but in Scotland. But it was very much to the fore in those years. 
And even though Ireland had voted, and the public voted in England to support their own government, the Liberal government, to an extent that the veto which the wealthy landlords in the House of Lords, very much responsive to the will or to the strength of their Irish holdings, the vast estates like Lord Londonderry, they still have a great deal of land in the north of Ireland. They were able uh, to frustrate the slow, painful advance. Even the Lord's veto was removed. And finally, on the eve of World War I breaking out, the situation was that it looked as though home rule was going to triumph and there would be a parliament in Dublin. Now, it, there was, the attack on that was such from the Tories, from the Anglo-Irish second sons in the British Army and in the Navy, that there was a real threat of civil war in England. In fact, some historians have said that you can trace the growth and the birth of fascism in Europe to the anti-home rule movement mounted by the Tory party, mounted by the establishment in England, by the field marshals like Field Marshal Wilson, by the great families. And it is a fact that some historians will draw attention to the advice that the Kaiser got from some of his advisors that the British would not fight because they were so preoccupied with Ulster. That was one of the reasons he went to war, one of the causative reasons of World War I. And as a result of that, home rule was postponed and passed, but put on the back burner until after the war. Now let's look for a moment at what home rule consisted of. It was compared to what appeared afterwards, and when people talk about the treaty and it falling short of national aspirations and of the vision of 1916, just con contrast it for a moment with what was an offer pre-World War I. The Parliament, so-called, in Ireland, in Dublin, would have been called at the discretion only of the Lord Lieutenant, and he would have appointed the Prime Minister in Dublin, not the people of Ireland. They had no control over taxation, customs and exercise, excise, and of course, not at all over the Navy or the Army. Now that called forth such a reaction for the Tory party that amongst the utterances and the actions that were taken, we had uh, Bonner Law urging them to go to the limit, break the boom as, as had been done in the siege of Derry, they would be supported. You had overt things which people realize now, and they've, they've, they saw them at the time, like the Curry Mutiny, when the British Army, on the eve of World War I, told the Liberal Prime Minister that they would not enforce Home Rule on Northern Ireland, on Ulster as they call it. On the other hand, and I think this is worth bearing in mind when you hear terms like loyalist used, and the loyalism of the North. These people had set up the first provisionals of the century, led by Carson and Sir James Craig. The Ulster Unionists had set up a provisional government that was to come into force the moment that not that armed insurrection broke out, not that soldiers appeared in the streets, but the moment that the Home Rule Bill passed into law, their response to the law of the land was to declare uh, a Home Rule, uh, an independent <laughs> Ulster, 
in defiance of uh, the London Parliament and to take all the powers of army, navy, security into their hands. And in that they were supported by the Tory party, entirely for its own interest. Not for any benefit of the people of Ulster, not for any benefit certainly of the people of England. And by doing that they sowed the seeds of partition which have poisoned the relationships between the two islands ever since. As a result of this, remember, the Ulster Unionists formed their own Ulster Volunteer Force. You've heard a lot about the Psalm and the gallantry of the Psalm, and it was in many ways. But these were the very people, the Ulster Volunteer Force, who were formed by their leaders, by the Craigs, by the Carsons, purely as, as gulls, as dupes, to frustrate home rule. And finally, they paid for it with their lives when they marched to their deaths in the Somme. And I use that phrase, gulls, advisedly, because one of the striking images that remains with me from my North of Ireland um, researches was that of a preacher in Belfast during the 30s, the time of great unemployment and misery. One of the few things for enjoyment that the workers had was to go along to a kind of speaker's corner which was held on the steps of City Hall. And they heard him preaching, he was particularly good, preaching fiery socialism, which had even less hope of gaining support in Belfast than Connolly had in Dublin with the hierarchy and a peasant uh, electorate and a largely farming uh, background. But one day, in disgust, as the realization was striking him, he wasn't going to get anywhere, he saw the gulls overhead and he looked at his audience and he said in disgust, see those gulls? They have more sense than you have. If you threw bread and sashes at them, the gulls would go for the bread. But you gulls, every time you go for the sashes. And he was right. And you have seen in your time, as you know, today's North of Ireland economy, it's a begging bowl economy. It subsists largely on the subsidies from England. The public service is the main employer. The second great source of income is agriculture, as here. It's an agricultural area the six counties of northeastern Ireland. And you had the leader of the biggest party going out and telling her gulls, by well, Lenny Foster, told her, lead, her followers not to vote for the bread, but to vote for the sashes and to vote to get out of the EEC, which is keeping a lot of her electorate in their homes and with it feeding their families. Brussels check is what keeps them there. So the sectarianism, Ulster will fight and Ulster will be right. The orange card is still alive and well. I don't have to go back over Ian Paisley's career and the party he founded, but just one slogan he coined, CRA, Civil Rights Association, equals IRA. That impelled a lot of young men into their debts. Anybody who went marching with and for civil rights was held to be a member of the IRA and it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. The people who founded the first provisionals back at the start of the century ultimately gave the other provisionals of our time their strength by demonizing everybody and driving civil rights marchers into the hands of the gunmen. Now, I think we have to look at it, the present situation of Ireland and the North in that light, in the Northern light, and what it might be token for us. Because Brexit has already begun. The actors have taken to the stage, but we don't know how the drama will unfold. But you can see that it means it, 
this holding to the sashes rather than to the present or what's good for their people, combined with a secondary factor which has not been popular, and I have unashamedly been drawing attention to it for decades, and that is the demographics. It means that Ulster, partition, the North, whatever phrase you use, is increasingly becoming part of contemporary politics. I was intrigued to see <coughs> no less a man than Michal Martin, that, that defender of Sinn Féin's or Frida Falls' uh, right to pilfer our pockets, <laughs> which has been challenged, of course, by Sinn Féin. Uh, he did point out, and he's a very astute leader, as his present position in the polls will indicate, that the North will become increasingly part of the, the nomenclature of Irish contemporary politics. <coughs> and on the front, which will really tell everything, that of demographics, I've been studying the figures for years, and I had a friend, long dead, Harry Diamond. Harry held the seat, Republican Labour, the Doc, Doc Ward seat that poor Jerry, uh, Jerry Fitt won. And I remember Jerry Fitt saying to me one night, well, you know, that ghost Rep Lab is coming to light. Jerry had no idea what he was getting into. He thought he'd get a house with a little woman, make a few jokes here, appear in a speech there. On the BBC, they all liked him and be the next seaman, he had that hair about you, north of Ireland humour. But he had no idea of the deeper currents of Irish history or that republicanism meant republicanism and that Labour meant what James Connolly meant. And that overturned him. He's now gone under the chariot wheels of history, dust. But his, success, his predecessor told me about an episode, what politics were like when he was a young politician during the war and after it, during the Great War, World War II. It was very, very difficult to get anything done for Catholics in the North, impossible. You now forget discrimination and gerrymandering and how they were treated. But then, if he wanted anything done, he had one ally, one friend. For some reason, the civil servant, secretary of the government, was particularly friendly to him. And he could always go and see him, and he would speak the word for a constituent or something, get him some concession. Otherwise, nothing. No bread for the gulls. And one day he went in, and here was this guy filling in forms and chuckling. He said, oh, Jerry, you like this. Some seminal intellect in the Unionist Party, forgetting about their reserved occupations, which kept them at home during the war. They even suspended the uh, Orange Marches during the war because they didn't want to give the sight of all these able-bodied men marching in the street <laughs> when they should have been enrolled as loyalists in the British Army, getting themselves killed. And who did it? enroll? The unemployed Catholics. And North and South, the Catholics won more VCs than the Canadians did. They won more medals of all sorts. And they distinguish themselves every way that traditionally Irish and Scots, the Celts, have always been used by the Empire in the forefront of the army. And had they worked it out, had they thought about it, and their reserved occupation, if you had a reserved occupation, i.e. if you had a job in the shipyard or so on, uh, steelworks, you could stay home. They should have realised that the Catholics were out fighting and they'd come out better. And this could have been a very embarrassing statistic. And the civil servants simply just change the figures around. And that has obtained that system in the census returns. The census actually, if they are properly extrapolated, as we speak here, the Catholics are ahead of all the combined Protestant sects. The Catholics are ahead of them in the primary school, secondary school, and in the tertiary level. And people say, some people don't want to think of United Ireland and say, oh, they'll never vote, come into the South with the bankruptcy, etc. Others say they will inevitably, etc. It doesn't matter what people say, it's happening. It's a fact. And taken with Brexit, the tectonic plates 
of the country as a whole are changing. And a Brexit type response will not hold back the tide. And it is a shame to see the cardiology going on in Stormont at the moment when they have an open and shut case over the unionists and the corruption over this service deal that NAMA connived at. Because bad as they are, they might be no good nicks, but they are the no good nicks of the people. And they're there and they'll have to be reckoned with, just as the unionists to some day. But the unionists, unfortunately, are sending their kids abroad. They're not coming back when they get education. And you're left with an unemployed, lumpen proletariat who don't have the automatic access to jobs of the shipyard, the, the heavy engineering work, the uncle, the father brought them in. The apprenticeship culture is gone. And that is our current situation vis-a-vis -vis the North. Now to look briefly at her own situation in the South in this anniversary year of 1916, we are emerging and the relevance to the North is not remote. We were always told automatically that, oh, we couldn't afford the North. And obviously there'd be a cost. And obviously the long-term plan, and I'm not breaking any secrets here, of the Anglo-Irish Department of Foreign Affairs, with the backing of governments, was that Britain would have to someday pick up a large check, maintain <coughs> social services at the present level, etc. Now, they never factored in Brexit. However, the EU is there, and the situation in the Republic is also there. One of the ghastly uh, effects of the crash, recession, whatever you call it, has been the death of the principle of accountability. Governments have used the lawyers and the devices such as tribunals to prevent people finding out what happened. There is no way that those tribunals were ever intended to bring forth truth, answers. They are, as George Bernard Shaw said, government commissions, they are like a man going to the lavatory. It sits for a long time, nothing is heard. Then there is a loud report and the matter is dropped. <laughs> Now, I only want to talk about, I'll only give you one example of this. The, before the courts, as we know, they're Anglo, and we know there are other people, and one has to be careful because these people will swoop and prove you can't get a fair trial because of what was said elsewhere. But the bank, which I would like to have seen, and it's, CEOs, its directors, its <coughs> senior management proceeded against was, was Allied Irish Bank. I don't think people really know. I think 30 billion, now just think for a moment, 30 billion is the amount of money they had to be bailed out with to keep them afloat. Their shares at the time of the crash were in the order of 20 euro. As we sit here, they are about one and a half cent. Now I repeat that, one and a half cent from 20 euro. Now it, it didn't come like Prometheus fully armed. There were several signposts along the way, scandal after scandal, dirt inquiries, all kinds of things that people in back rooms in the mafia would have thought of, not gentlemen in pinstripe suits in the upper echelons of buildings in Ball's Bridge, which is probably better described in this context as testicles viaduct. <laughs> but, quite rightly, when the government, led by Enda Kenny, came in, not the last election, the previous one, they proposed their very first order of business, and rightly so, because we're a bit like the gulls, we forget. We don't have a sense of outrage in this country about what's done to us. People don't get annoyed about what's on the news. It's just part of the noise in the background. Like Pat Hickey's haircut. 
some might think that they didn't start low enough down on his neck, but anyway. <laughs> in any way, as the fellow said, the government rightly said that people had a right to know what had happened. And they proposed to extend the parliamentary commission system, the parliamentary committees as we have them now, so they could inquire into these events and make recommendations as to fact. And what happened? People were annoyed at what had happened and they didn't uh, want to give politicians any more power. They thought they already had too much and the Jews were wrongly. And the killer punch was eight former attorney generals wrote to the media and said, if this nefarious instrument passed into law, it would interfere with the man's right to his good name and the independence of the judiciary. And it fell. And the Gulls, the Irish electorate, never noticed that two of the signatories, two of the ex-attorney generals, were former chairman of Allied Irish Bank, Peter Sutherland and Dermot Gleeson. And now we have Mr. Uh, another signatory, um, the founder of the um, PDs, Mr. McDowell, an interestingly a descendant of the man who really made a job of the 1916 rising, uh, <laughs> McNeil, uh, writing to the papers the other day, last Sunday indeed, uh, saying that the, the, you know, the inquiry they propose to hold into the tickets will get nowhere because you can't compare witnesses, you can't produce documents, and the banking inquiry, which came and went, one of the, uh, I don't know why he went on it in the first place, uh, Doherty, the Fianna Fáil, uh, the Fianna Sinn Féin spokesperson in finance, got off at saying it was useless because if Brian Cowan came in saying that he had a red sweater on and they could see it was blue, you couldn't say that because it was a finding as to fact. <laughs> and that might seem funny, but it is appalling. What they have done, there is a word you never hear mentioned in any economic discussion. These learned people are talking economic jargon and RTE. Have any one of you ever heard them mention the word suicide? Look at the number of people who were killed by the bankers, the lawyers, the accountants. We don't have accountability. That is certainly falling very short of the republic that Connolly <coughs> and Clark and Pierce had in mind when they gave their lives for a document that said, we plan to cherish all the children of the nation equally. Have we done that? I leave it to think of that themselves, but I, <coughs> I don't normally like to use a script. Rightly or wrongly, I think it breaks up um, the flow, as it were. But to the best of my ability, because my eyesight's not very good, and they have carefully put blinds across these windows. Would you ever push that one back a bit? Didn't I? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to read something that I first published on the 50th anniversary of the Rising in my first book, which was called Ireland Since the Rising. And it's an interview with Kathleen Clark, Tom's widow. It's, um, I think it's a particularly good interview, and I've reproduced it in my next book, which will be coming out next month or so, uh, which is about Michael Collins' Twelve Apostles. But I'd like to give you a preview of it here, because I do think it shouldn't lie in an out-of-print book. People, if there was any message in 16, I think it was idealism. The idea of service to the state, self-sacrifice, whatever you call it. Some belief that you didn't rip off your fellow citizens as the bankers and the professional betrayers of our society have done. Now, the point about Kathleen Clark, I should tell you, she kept the show on the road after 16. Uh, she was in touch with John Devoy and he sent her the money that fed many a survivor or families of the 16 people. 
rising because I don't have to stress that to have out in 16 on your CV did not qualify you for state benefit in those days. And any money they had, that's where it came from. They were very, very hard up. And also, whatever remnants of the IRB, she kept the treads going. Now, meanwhile, over in Frongok, there was a young man called Michael Collins who had escaped the firing squads, who had been very kind to her husband uh, when he, they lay out overnight after the surrender in the rotunda, relieving themselves out in the open. And Tom Clark was a particular pain because he'd shot himself in the elbow before 1916, pistol practice, revolver practice. And uh, be between prison and everything, he shouldn't have been out at all. His health was terrible. But um, Collins kept him alive by wrapping his arms around him. And then he got uh, badly treated by an English officer who had him stripped and paraded in front of the nurses in the rotunda. And Collins never forgot that. And when they got the squad on the road and got established to the revolution going again, one of the first people he had shot was that English officer, Lee Wilson. So C Kathleen uh, knew Collins both from his reputation as an organizer and from his kindness to her husband. And when uh, he got out of prison, she turned over the work of the Prisoners Aid Association, distribution of the money to him. And he used the organization then to spread the IRB throughout Ireland with results you know of. And I leave you yourselves to work out whether he would have wanted the sort of results that Allied Irish Bank gave us or another outcome, or whether James Connolly would have wanted that. Now, this is the interview I conducted uh, with Kathleen Clark, Tom's widow. I conducted an interview with this remarkable woman on the 50th anniversary of the Rising, which I think on this 100th should be reproduced. She was then 72. Throughout the interview, she suffered what are now termed senior moments. Her memory would temporarily desert her, but she would sit quietly and in silence for a moment and then resume exactly where she'd left off. Her eyes were like large faded sapphires and it was hard to look straight at them without flinching. There's no record of her ever having flinched from anything. The night before her husband's execution, she was in the castle in detention with some other women. And she told me, I thought that in the morning we were likely to be brought before the commanding officer. So I'd taken off my blouse and skirt and hung them up so that I wouldn't look too bad. There were six of us and we had only one blanket over us. We'd been very annoyed at some young British soldiers coming to flirt with us. It was outrageous. Then an officer came and said I had permission to see my husband. My God, Kathleen, said one of the girls. What does that mean? It means death, I said. Oh, no, said the girl. Mary Perlows was her name. Look, said I. Do you think that if the British government were going to send my husband on a journey any shorter than to the next world, that they get an officer in a car out at midnight to go for me. You're a stone, said the girl. I was. We were stopped several times. There were snipers on a lot of rooftops, and I didn't think we'd be let go on. But the officer showed his pass, and we got through. Kinmainham was terrible, the conditions. There was a monk downstairs. He told me that my husband had put him out of the cell. There was no light in it, only a candle that a soldier held. Why did you surrender, I asked Tom. Typical woman, the worst word in her mouth, the last thing she meant to say. <laughs> her husband faced an execution. Why did you surrender? <laughs> I thought you were going to hold out for six months. <laughs> I wanted to, he said, but the vote went against me. We talked about the future the whole time. I never saw him so buoyed up. He said that the first blow had been struck and that Ireland would get her freedom, but she'd have to go through hell first. He had to face the ordeal by himself in the morning. If I broke down, it might have broken him down. So I changed the subject. I said, what do you do to that priest down here, down there? That damn fella came in here, he said. 
And he told me he'd give me a confession if I'd admit that I was wrong and that I was sorry. I am not sorry. I told him that I gloried in it, what I had done. I was expecting a baby, but I didn't tell him that in case it might upset him. I asked an officer to have his body sent to me. He hemmed and he hawed, and he said he had no instruction about it. In the end, he promised to do something. But he wrote to me afterwards to say that I couldn't have the body. I walked home from the castle to Fairview. There was a smell of burning in the air. I had to walk in the middle of the road because things were falling off the roofs. In O'Connell Street, a big policeman stopped me. When I told him who I was and where I was going, he said, Yeah, better go down to Fairview, ma'am. There are some soldiers up there at Parnell's Monument and they're not very nice. I had to climb over a big pile of rubble in North Earl Street. The bricks were still hot. I never met a sinner all the way home. I'd sent the children down to Limerick and there was no one in the house. I don't drink, but I had whiskey and brandy in the house in case any wounded were brought in. Now I thought I'd have won 24 hours of oblivion. And I took out a bottle of port and I filled myself a glass. I thought it'd be strong, but sure I was awake in an hour. My sister came up from the country that night and a lorry came and took us to Kilmainham to say goodbye to my brother, Ned Daly, famous Limerick feeding and family, the Daly's. I heard her coming before anyone and I said, they're coming to take us to Ned. He's going to be shot. They thought I was going mad. Off my head. But a few minutes later, we all heard it. Her antenna must have been like a cat's. A few minutes later, we all heard it. It stopped outside the house. My sister didn't want me to go, but I insisted. My brother was in uniform. He looked about 18. There was a group of officers outside the cell, and they seemed to have some spite against him. The soldier holding the candle had been in my husband's firing party. He said my husband was the bravest man he'd seen. I lost the baby a week later. I don't know if it was a boy or a girl. I worked at the prisoner's aid fund even when I was in bed. It saved me from going mad. God must have put the idea in my head. And for several months after the rising, she was the person who kept the revolutionary frame alive. And she'd elected the monies, and then she handed them over to a young man called Michael Collins. And Michael, like Kathleen's husband, Tom, saw the rising as only a beginning. The real war was to come. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.